In part two of chapter 20, we're going to talk all about hydrocarbons, continue with alkanes and start learning nomenclature, discuss alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic hydrocarbons. And by the end of this video, you should know what all of those mean, alkane, alkene, alkyne, aromatic, as well as how to name things, the basics of nomenclature, which is what we start with right here. Okay? All of the nomenclature that I test is based on IUPAC, okay, the International Union of Peer and Applied Chemistry. We use that system, which is based on naming what's called the parent hydrocarbon, which we kind of alluded to before looking at isomers. It's the longest uninterrupted chain of carbon atoms, right? How far can you trace with your finger without doubling back on yourself? That's the root of our name, right? that longest uninterrupted carbon chain. And then we add prefixes or suffixes to that to discuss substituents and where they are, things like functional groups. So here's another key idea that you should know. The first six names, starting with one carbon, which is methane, two carbons, ethane, three, propane, four, butane, five, pentane, six, hexane. If you continue to organic, you'll be expected to know more, but at this level, you should know those first six. And here's some examples of those. Here, I've got on the left-hand side there and in the middle, three forms of propane. We actually saw two methyl propane discussed in the butane column because it has four carbons. But in those first three examples going from left to right, our longest uninterrupted carbon chain is three. So they're named as propane. It could be propane on itself or propane with a substituent. Okay, here I have a chlorine group, which is named as a chloro substituent, and it's on carbon two. Over here, I have a CH3, which is named as a methyl substituent, again on carbon two. On the right hand side there, my longest uninterrupted carbon chain is six, and I have two fluorine substituents, so I call it difluorohexane. And the two and the four tell me the numbers of the carbons where those are. And notice the numbering can differ. It can go from left to right or right to left. You can do it either way. The goal is to produce the lowest number possible, which is why there for difluorohexane, it's two, four, instead of numbering it the other way, which would be three, five. Other than that, the only other rule is to name the substituents in alphabetical order. So you could give this one a try. Right? How do I name this? Well, it's got four carbons and it's uninterrupted chain. So that's named as butane, which you should know. And then it's got substituents, a bromine and a chlorine. So how do I number it to get the lowest number possible? Well, in this situation, I would number it from right to left so that I get the numbers one and two instead of three and four. So this would be named as 2-bromo-1-chlorobutane. Notice the 2 gets comes before the 1 because bromine or bromo comes before chloro in the alphabet. So let's talk more about that CH3 that we saw before. Okay, We saw chlorine is chloro, bromine is bromo. How do I name substituents, carbon chains, that are coming off of my parent? Okay, These are called alkyl groups. And they're just like an alkane, except they have one fewer hydrogen than the alkane would because that bond is going to the parent hydrocarbon. And we name those by dropping A-N-E from the root name of the alkane and replacing it with Y-L, which is why for a CH3, which would be methane if it was CH4, it became methyl. And these get some unique names depending on which hydrogen is removed. Here we have methyl and ethyl, and there's only one way to do that, right? And that's how we got 2-methylpropane. But there are other situations. Notice if I remove one from the end of a propane, it's called n-propyl, but if I pull it from the middle, it's called isopropyl. You don't have to know those at this level, okay? but you should know how to name a general alkyl substituent, like a methyl or an ethyl. Those are our basics of nomenclature. We'll talk about them more when we get to alkenes and alkynes. But let's talk about reactions next. How do alkanes react? Well, as mentioned in the first video, they can undergo combustion reactions. And we've discussed a combustion 
previously, right? Oh, I skipped ahead of slide. A combustion, right, is a reaction with oxygen to produce CO2 and H2O. Alkenes also undergo, as shown on this slide, radical reactions. Okay? Here we see a radical substitution. And in order to do that, alkanes have to have heat or light as what's known as a radical initiator. Okay. And then when I put chlorine onto ethane, right, it's called chloroethane, no number needed there because it doesn't matter where you put the chlorine, it would always be number one. Okay. And that imparts what's known as a functional group on a molecule. That chlorine is a functional group, and the definition of a functional group is a part of a molecule that controls its reactivity. Okay. So what that means is an ethane with a chlorine group would react more like a propane with a chlorine group than just the general ethane. Okay. That chloro is kind of controlling its identity. So that's the basics of alkanes. What about alkenes? Okay. Alkenes have at least one double bond. Okay. Alkene has a double bond. And alkenes, alkynes, and aromatics are all known as unsaturated compounds. They have at least one double or triple bond between your carbon atoms, okay. which is the same definition for unsaturated fats, for example. Okay. Unsaturated compound, at least one double or triple bond. An alkene has a double bond, right, which is that double bond is one sigma bond, one pi bond which changes the geometry, right? Goes to sp2 hybridized, trigonal planar, changes some of the properties. We see these used to make plastics a lot in polymerization reactions. The general formula for an alkene, if you have one double bond, is CnH2n, whereas an alkane, which is fully saturated, is CnH2n plus two. Here's an example of a couple of alkenes. We've got ethene, propene, and 1-butene. And here's how those polymerization reactions look, okay. which you can see is done quite a bit in different plastics. So where do those names come from? Well, an alkane ended the name in A-N-E. An alkene ends the name in E-N-E, -E, which is easy to remember because it's in the name, alkane and alkene. But if there's any ambiguity with where I could put the double bond in an alkene, I have to number it. Okay. And I don't include both numbers for where the double bond connects. I just include the lower number, telling me where the carbon double bond starts. Okay. The location of the substituents is also important. As we remember, a double bond, right, that pi bond locks us into place, which means we can't freely rotate, which is why we have things like cis and trans isomers that we've discussed before. Our substituents are locked into position. Okay, so here's some examples. Ethene and propene don't need numbers because it doesn't matter where you put the double bond, it'll always be C1. But notice the difference between 1-butene, where the double bond starts at carbon 1, and 2-butene, where the double bond starts at carbon 2. We should name those as well with regard to their isomerism, right? Because our geometric isomers can have things in different areas. Right, alkenes is specifically looking at the double bond. And recall from last semester, right, this is old material, a cis isomer has hydrogens on the same side of the double bond, and a trans isomer has the hydrogens on opposite sides of the double bond, which is important because cis and trans isomers have different physical properties, different boiling points, for example. Yep. So over here, right, with 2-butene, I can have cis or I can have trans. And I have to include that in the name as well. Can't have that for one butene because the hydrogens, it doesn't matter if I flip them, right? There's too many hydrogens. But over here with two butene, you can have cis and trans. What kind of reactions do our alkenes do? Well, that carbon-carbon bond is a reactive functional group. It's known as a nucleophile in organic because the pi bond is weaker, right? And it can react. So alkenes do lots of reactions, but a common one that you see is known as an addition reaction, which is shown right here. Notice the chlorine has just added to the molecule, whereas with the alkene, it re chlorine replaced something. It was a substitution reaction. Here, this is an addition reaction. And that brings us to alkynes. Definition of an alkyne is a hydrocarbon with a triple bond. Right? Remember, a triple bond is a sigma bond and two pi bonds. 
sp hybridized on those carbons, therefore linear geometry. General formula for an alkyne is CnH2n minus 2. These guys are named by replacing ANE from the parent alkane with YNE. Okay. Again, right in the name. And these guys can react similar to alkenes, but because they have two, two pi bonds, they can undergo the reactions twice. We see that here. Here's an example of an alkyne with ethyne. Here's an example of an addition reaction with an alkyne. And we finished the video by discussing aromatics. Yeah. There are several criteria that an aromatic compound has to meet. They have to be cyclic, they have to be planar, they have to have a certain number of electrons. All of those criteria are discussed in organic. Right. But if they meet all the criteria, they are exceptionally stable okay, due to electron delocalization. Okay. The simplest and most common member of aromatic hydrocarbons is benzene, which is C6H6, shown right here. And there are a bunch of derivatives of these, right? If you think about drug candidates that are developed, okay, something like 70% of all new drugs have at least one benzene ring in there okay, with other substituents on top of it. The two resonance contributors are shown right here for benzene, but really the electrons are delocalized throughout the entire ring, which makes them super stable. And here are some derivatives of benzene as well. So know from this video what those terms mean. No alkane, no alkene, no alkyne, no aromatic. The fact that they have to have rings and delocalized electrons. Know the basics of nomenclature and you'll be well on your way to finish the chapter in our next video where we look at other functional groups like alcohols, esters, and nitrogen-containing compounds.